Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Ben Danun, and greetings to you on the first day of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, uh, known as the Festival of Lights, it is actually the, the real definition behind Hanukkah is dedication. It is a dedication of the temple uh, that happened around 165 uh, BCE, as most Jews would refer it, before the Common Era, uh, before Christ, we would say BC. And it is a time where the Maccabee brothers, Judah Maccabee, with the men that were with him, that actually came and liberated the temple uh, from the Greeks and the Syrians who had laid siege over Israel for quite some time. They liberated it. And in this great battle that went on in Jerusalem there, uh, where God delivered the temple back into the, the Jewish hands once again, they, were, they got there and there was only one cruise of oil left for the menorah. Now, this particular cruise would only last for the burning of the, of the menorah uh, candle opera, which is a seven candle opera there. It would only last for one night. But miraculously, it burned for eight days. And that was a miracle in itself, uh, the oil that could last that long. And it gave enough time for the purification for the uh, rabbis to be able to process and make the new oil for the temple uh, menorah. So very interesting story behind that. And of course, those that may not know uh, just how serious this was, <clears throat> the Greeks, uh, which is also part of the Roman Empire of Alexandria the Great, uh, men, men are like this here, but they had come in uh, through an alliance with Israel when Israel was uh, fearful of her, her neighbors, made an alliance thinking it would bring peace only uh, to find out that they began to get an upper hand on the, on the Jewish people. Something I like, I want to just share with you some of the things that are written in the historical documentation about Hanukkah. Um, one here is written, after the death of Alexander the, the Great, his empire was divided among his generals. Israel, the kingdom of Judea, was added to the empire of Antiochus III, king of Syria. When Antiochus IV uh, of Epiphanes became king of the Syrian Greeks, he was not content to accept the taxes of loyalty of the Jews as his predecessor had done. He wanted the Jews to lay aside their Torah and ancient religion and their place uh, substitute the Hellenistic Greek culture and Grecian idols. Now, it's kind of interesting because that's exactly what Rome and all the world would like for Israel to do as well. Lay aside, put out the idea of the Temple Mount, building a third temple. We need you to do exactly what we want you to do, quote unquote, is basically the idea that the world has in mind for Israel and what they hold holy and true and dear to themselves. So he goes on to say here, or in the article here that's written here on uh, yashanet.com, it reads here, the King Antiochus uh, IV uh, bore down on the Jewish subjects with a measure of ruthlessness, stubbornness, and cruelty that earned him the nickname Antiochus the Madman. He defiled the temple, filling it with pagan idols, placing a Hellenistic priest in the temple, and requiring the sacrifice of pigs on the altar. He forbade the Jews to observe uh, the commandments of Brit, um, um, me, Brit Milah, which is circumcision, uh, also the Rosh HaKodesh, uh, the, the, the new moon, the Sabbath, and, and barred the reading of the Torah. As I said, is it not interesting to see the similarities of exactly what's going on in the Temple Mount? Uh, the Catholic Church is allowed to take over the Mount Zion. They're allowed to have, a, their, as they call it, their Holy Communion, push the Jews out of the tomb of David and hold a Holy Communion there. The Muslims are able to take the Temple Mount and keep the Jews out completely. Oh, yes, so that's some of the Catholic people up there with no problem. A few priests, it's okay to bring them up there, the Pope, everybody else. But uh, Jews are not allowed to pray. In fact, getting to visit up there is a pretty good job and feat within itself. Needless to say, it seems to be quite ridiculous. Um, Jews who dared to remain loyal to their faith were brutally tortured and murdered. If a woman had her infant circumcised, she was murdered, the baby publicly hanged, and all who participated in the circumcision ceremony were executed and their property confiscated against this backdrop of Jewish resistance began to weaken, and it seemed inevitable 
that the last remnant of resistance would soon be wiped out. Uh, then one courageous old man turned the tide. His name was Mattia, uh, Mattia, or Matthew, Matthias, and he was a, uh, a priest. He was a Cohen, uh, the head of the uh, Has, uh, Hasmonean family, uh, the high priest family from the Judean town of, uh, excuse me, Modin, Modin near Lod. The Syrian Greek governor, Matthew's region, set up an idol in Modin, rounded up the townspeople, and introduced an enlightened Jew who would sacrifice a pig on the idol in recognition of the decree of Antiochus. Uh, old Matthew stepped forward and slew the traitor. Isn't that interesting? An enlightened Jew. That's pretty much what we're going to get if we end up putting someone like Miss. Livni or any of these other guys that are out there running for Prime Minister of Israel other than Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu, don't get me wrong, I'm not very pleased with the fact that he's even given any consideration to the Vatican whatsoever. I understand he's under a lot of world pressure, but step up, Prime Minister. Step up to the plate. Step up and do what God would have you do. Tear down the Dome of the Rock. Tear down the Vatican uh, churches that are all in, in and around the old city as well. Bring down these idols to Baal. Set up the Sabbath the way God intended and commanded that the city gates be closed during the Sabbath and that no work would be done during that time. And I know there's a lot of Christian friends that would be opposing to that, but I realize that maybe they don't quite understand what God's commandments are regarding this issue. But there's also a lot of Christians that also support our people and support the fact that God gave us a Sabbath and commanded us to keep this as a perpetual promise to Him, a perpetual law. Even in the Christian Bible, in the closing chapter, the very last chapter, in fact, of the book of Revelation, it also states there those that had the testimony of Christ and kept God's commandments. So, not to get into a big issue on that, but the point is, is that we're seeing a lot of similarities from the time of the Maccabees. And by the way, the book of Maccabees was actually part of a canon of Scripture at one time. Uh, but nonetheless, it's not, not that way today. It'd be good for you to read it. It'd give you an interesting insight to see exactly what happened there. But let's just kind of look at the rest of this about Matthias here and what happened there. Um, so anyway, with the, with the rallying, rallying cry of Mi La Hashem, excuse me, uh, Ali, whoever is for Hashem, let him come to me. He called the people to rebellion. A pitiful small number responded at first. The people were numb with fear of hopelessness. But Matthew's five sons led the way. They fought the Syrian Greeks, uh, retreated to the mountains, and began to guerrilla war against the Syrian Greeks and their Jewish allies. Matthew had not long to live, but on his death, uh, deathbed, he charged his sons to carry on the struggle. The glorious brothers heeded his command. He passed on the leadership to the second son, Judah, Maccabee, who was a mighty warrior and charismatic leader. Many miracles happened, uh, outnumbered a number, uh, excuse me, a hundred to one. Judah and his men won many battles. Jewish Jews came to join him. A few years he had defeated the, the mightiest armies of, the Syria, uh, of Syria. Victory belonged to the Jew, the pure, the righteous, the loyal defender of the Torah. Following the rebellion, kingdom of Israel was restored for 200 years until the destruction of the second temple in 70 A.D., so very interesting to see the historical side there when Israel is willing to stand for God. God would be willing to stand for them. Eight days this light burned. Well, in other news I'd like to cover with you, and by the way, we wish you a happy Hanukkah, a happy dedication. In fact, this is a perfect time in Israel's history to have a real Hanukkah. This is the time that Israel should do as Judah Maccabee and his brothers and brave men that fought with him, they should stand up and fight for those very rights and restore back Israel according to the way God intended. Restore back the temple on the Temple Mount. You know, God would take care of the rest. God would take care of the identity of the Messiah for Israel. 
Perhaps Moses and Elijah even would come up at this time. You know, there has to be a covenant signed, and there has to be the seven years. That covenant has to be broken. So somebody in politics is going to wake up, no doubt about it. Also, Kerry has reported that, uh, that the United States will vow to veto any UN resolution um, that comes in to push the PA, uh, the Palestinian Authority's bid for, for recognition as a state. Uh, it's kind of an interesting twist, makes you wonder just exactly what's going on behind that there. So in a meeting between the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Palestinian Authority PA Chief Negotiator Saab Arkat in London on Tuesday, Kerry reportedly finally promised to veto a PA resolution bid at the U.N. Security Council after a flip-flopping on U.S. action. A PA official said PA threatened that it will submit the draft resolution on Wednesday regardless of the veto. Any push to get the UN to recognize the PA as a state and demand Israel withdraw from Judea and Samaria within two years. Kerry told Palestinian delegation, we will use our veto, the official said of the meeting, which was also to include Arab League Secretary General Nabil al Arabi. Kerry has until now not given a clear statement on whether or not the U.S. will veto as it is traditional has, has on such motions. So I just have to kind of see what's going on. It kind of really makes me wonder what is going on in the background for, the, for John Kerry to be doing that. And also there's been many terrorist attacks that have been foiled here recently in Israel, including one woman that disguised herself as if she was pregnant in uh, Tel Aviv. The Israeli forces were able to thwart uh, her suicide bombing attempt there to, to kill as many people as she possibly could. And, uh, and so just go, you know, things are just going on and on and on and on and on. Uh, anyway, also uh, there was a Mossad agent that uh, has been discovered in Hezbollah. Uh, he was a, a Lebanese-born man who, uh, who had climbed the ranks in Hezbollah. And uh, the Israeli government, of course, paid him millions of dollars to infiltrate and have thwarted many attacks against Israeli civilians as a result of his ability to, to work his way up into, into the, uh, the, uh, the Iranian group Hezbollah in, inside of their organization. In fact, uh, the organization, after several failed attempts, according to Israel National News, uh, decided to do a little investigation themselves on why this particular group that was called Unit 910 kept failing at its missions. They discovered there was a group of men working for the Mossad that were leaking the information to Israel as a result. I'm Stephen Bendenoon. Happy Hanukkah, and God bless you, and we do love you. Good night.